You're the one. We'll sing the first two, then the chorus, next two, then the chorus. All we have it? Let us sing. Lord, the people praise you. Lord, the people Lift you up and raise you. Lift you up and raise you. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. Lord, the people love you. Place nobody above you. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. Sing halle, halle, hallelujah. All the glory is due you. Cause you are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. Bless your name, Lord Jesus. Only name that frees us. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. We will praise you right here and now. Lest the hills and the rocks cry out. And you are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. Sing halle, halle, hallelujah. All the glory is due you. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. If we had 10,000 hands, we would bless you as you command. Because you are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. If we had 10,000 tongues, we would bless you with everyone. You are the Holy One. You're the one, you're the only one. Sing halle, halle, hallelujah. All the glory is due you. Heavenly Father, we're thankful, Father, once again for this opportunity, Lord, to come together, Father, to praise you, Father, worship you, Father, study another portion of your divine and holy word, Father. We ask, Father, that you be in the midst of us, Father, as we go through your word, Father. Help us, Father, to apply it to our lives and be able to teach those who are in darkness, Father. Continue, Father, to let your spirit dwell within us all. Continue to help us, Father, to lean on your understanding, Father, not our own. We're just thankful, Father. We ask special prayers for those in the household of faith, Father, who are sick and afflicted, whatever the case may be, Father. Whatever trials they may be going through, Father, we ask, Father, that you be with them, Father, and touch them in a special way. We love you, Father, because you first loved us, Father, and you gave your son, Father, Christ Jesus, so we might have the right to eternal life. We thank you, Father, and we just ask why you continue to just bless us. These things and all things we ask and give thanks in the name of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Brother Dash, Brother Tony. Good, good evening to everyone. God bless you. Good to see you once again. <clears throat> we are going through right now our look through the book of Acts. And as we mentioned before, we are coming to the conclusion of the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. And this journey started at Acts 15, 36, and it ends at Acts 18, verse number 22, although our reading today carried us into 23. It started, the first one was in Acts 13, verse number 4, to 14, verse number 28. And then we have that brief intermission for the Jerusalem Council that pretty much took up all of Acts 15 and started a little bit uh, into, uh, you know, our second journey, which again uh, starts towards uh, the beginning of Acts chapter number 16. And in this uh, Acts chapter number 16, we see a number of things that happened, the meeting of Timothy and uh, the separation of Paul and Barnabas, and then how they go on. In fact, let's go to the slide. I believe I have some of this on a on a slide. So yes, Acts 13 and 14 is, uh, that should say, uh, the, the first, this is a misprint, the first journey was Acts 13 and 14. The second journey starts at Acts 16. So there's a, a correction to be noted there, but this kind of gives us a walkthrough of where we're at all the way coming down. We are now in Acts 18. I didn't have time to edit edit this slide. I kind of do these things sometimes on the fly. But you notice there in blue, as we were saying before, how sometimes it's not always about the big crowd. It's not always about uh, large numbers, because when we start looking at the people that were influenced by the Apostle Paul, that the Holy Spirit chose to list their names, we noted how each person was somehow a person of influence. Sergius Paulus, which is, was the deputy of that uh, area there. And then when you get down, young Timothy, who becomes basically his ride or die for the rest of his life. And then we see in Acts 16, Lydia, who was a businesswoman, a seller of purple, uh, who actually continues to support, or continues to support the Apostle Paul pretty much through the rest of his ministry, even while he was in prison in Rome. We'll get to that once he... Once we get there, we'll start looking at the Philippian letter a little bit closer. Then the Philippian jailer, we don't talk much about the jailer himself, but most of these people were tired Roman military men, and they were always of rank. They were men that were of rank, if you were going to be the head jailer at least. And so the Philippian jailer was once again a person that had some influence over his soldiers and over prisoners. And then we got into Acts 17, the mob at Thessalonica, and then those rude fellows of the Bezor sort followed him to Berea, and he had to leave Berea, and then he traveled to Athens, and there he was in the Areopagus, and uh, he spoke to them about the unknown God, but when we look towards the end, it talks about Dionysus and Damaris. Dionysus was the Areopagate. He was the head guy. He ran the whole thing, and Damaris, just by her being there, was, we believe, was a woman of some influence, of some importance, so that she was able to participate in these discussions, which usually were dominated by men. And then in Acts chapter number 18, which is where we're at, we're kind of wrapping up Acts chapter number 18. But on last week, we noticed Crispus and Sosthenes, how Crispus was the first chief ruler of the synagogue. The Bible tells us in Acts 18 that he and his household were, were baptized. And then later on, he was placed, replaced by Sosthenes who after the decision of, of Gallio, which basically allowed the Apostle Paul or gave him legal right or freedom to continue to preach the gospel uh, there in Corinth, Sosthenes was beaten. But then if you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 1, and then you go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse number 14, both of these men, men are mentioned having come to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what I see in the text from the Holy Spirit is that it's not always about numbers. It's just we, you, I, all of us, we just continue to preach the gospel. 
and allow Christ, allow God, allow the Holy Spirit to work on people's lives. So we're here now, and we're coming back. He's leaving Ephesus. He's coming down. He's going into Caesarea, and then uh, to, uh, up to Antioch, which is the home base, and we'll get to that. In fact, on the next, uh, the next lesson, we'll see where Paul is going to make his circuit back through Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, and then when we pick him up again, he's going to be back in Ephesus, Lord willing, on next, on next week. But today we were looking at a specific part of the text, and as I mentioned before, that sometimes it's, it's easy for us as ministers to uh, pretty much just overlook a certain passage because it may not be as sexy, it may not have uh, you know, the interest that we might think, but our job really is just to preach the Word of God in its, in its simple and plain form. And so we run across this text, and we just felt it was too important to pass over. So Acts chapter number 18, the verse there uh, is number 18. And, that, and Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took leave of the brethren, sailed thence unto Syria. And with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Centuria, for he had a vow. We talked about that vow. The Bible doesn't really say specifically which one it was. It could have been a Nazarite vow, but we know that uh, back in those days it was a custom of the people uh, to sometimes make a vow uh, unto the Lord, which for us is another word for fast, where they were fasting to God for a specific purpose and a specific duration of time. And many of them were to express thanks for deliverance from grave dangers, and then once they completed that time, whatever the amount of time for the fast, it was customary for them to shave their heads, indicating that they had concluded their fast, or they had concluded their vow, or they had met the conditions of the vow. So verse number 19 says, And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer with them, he consented not, but, obeyed, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. This was central to our lesson today, but just for context, let's continue to read. He says, but I will return again unto you, and if God will, and he sailed from Ephesus. So we looked at our text there. We wanted to start talking about what was going on uh, in uh, Paul's mind. Let's continue reading first. Uh, and when uh, he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, uh, he went down to Antioch. This basically con concludes the second missionary journey. He's back at home base. He's back at camp, uh, uh, base camp. He's back at the headquarters now where the uh, first century church started to gather because Jerusalem was a dangerous place after the stoning of Stephen. It just wasn't safe there. So they had started to gather in Antioch and preach the gospel. And so Paul now has returned all the way from uh, his second journey. He's back to Antioch. Well, verse 23 is where we're going to pick up uh, for next week, Lord willing. But I just read it for context. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went all over the country of Galatia and Pergia in order. And we made note of that because Paul, it was planned. Paul just didn't just say, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go visit my old friends here. I'm gonna go. No, Paul had a mission. Everything was centered around got the gospel and, and um, sharing the good news. And it says strengthening all the disciples. And so we'll pick up on that a little bit later. So we started to talk a little bit about the Moedim, uh, the Moedim being uh, the plural, plural, I'm sorry, of Moed. Moed uh, is uh, appointed times or feast. The Moedim is the plural version um, of that. So we began to look at uh, the Moedim or the appointed times because Paul says, I must needs meet this feast or I must needs go to Jerusalem for this feast. And we looked at some of the breakdown of the words and, and what was going on, at least in, in Paul's mind, uh, from a, a cultural standpoint so that we could begin uh, to understand uh, what Paul was, was talking about and why he would uh, continue to do the mo to follow the Moedim. And then we went over to Genesis chapter number 1. The verse there is number 14. And Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 14, the Bible says, 
And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Once again, we see that word moed, uh, which again, if you look down here at the NASB translation, you can see it uh, translated appointed feast, appointed feast, appointed festival, appointed sign, appointment, assembly, a definite time, meeting place, times, times, times appointed. So what we're talking about, in, in, in when we read our English translation many times, we think of food. But for Paul and his mindset, it was a time. He knew he had to be there. It's like he had an appointment. <clears throat> so when we looked at the uh, Moedim itself, uh, we noticed that there are four spring feasts, and then there are three fall feasts. The Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Pentecost. And then there's, uh, there's nothing in there in the middle. And then you get the fall, which is the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Atonement, and then the Feast of Tabernacle. As I mentioned before, uh, we did a lesson series a few years ago here at Palomar. And we looked at, uh, well, we didn't look at all seven. We looked at the first four and then we did one each week, and we, we really wanted to know how Christ fulfilled each one of those. And then the last three, which are future, how Christ will fulfill those. And so today's lesson was kind of a compilation of all that, which made it a little bit difficult to uh, really try to get, uh, get it all in one, you know, one setting. What's not included is the Feast of Lots or Purim, because there's, there's two additional feasts that uh, the Jews have that... Um, that are not included in this. We're not looking at it because there's one uh, in Esther where there was a, a feast of lots or Purim, uh, which they were celebrating the fact that they were marked for death. If you remember that, uh, that uh, the book of Esther and Mordecai, her uncle, and, and how the edict came down that they were all supposed to be put to death. Well, after that, uh, the, the book of Esther, after that ended, there was a, a feast that they enacted for that. And the other one is Feast of Hanukkah. You probably heard of that. Uh, the Feast of Lights or Dedication. This is regarding uh, uh, the Maccabees and the revolt against the Romans and how once they had more or less got the Romans after, out of their back, they had a Feast of Light. And right now, to this very day, the Jews still celebrate this by lighting candles. Most of the time, it's like eight candles, and there's some significance in there for them for that. Uh, but we didn't go into those because uh, we just felt that those were not part of the original seven that were in the Levitical law. And so we, we excluded them uh, for that purpose. The ones we looked at was the Passover. We looked at also the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Then we looked at the Feast of First Fruits. Then we looked at the, P, the Feast of Pentecost, which was obviously the one that I think a lot of us are most familiar with, uh, but we just always don't understand, uh, you know, its origin and the significance of it. Uh, something that was not in the lesson today uh, is going through uh, what Christ did and what he went through uh, before he was uh, put, on, uh, put on the cross. There were six trials. Uh, these have been preached in various forms in some of our uh, some of our sermons, and you'll probably see them uh, continuing from time to time. There were essentially three, uh, three trials by the Jews and then three by the Romans. You see Annas, Caiaphas, and the Sanhedrin, and then you see Pilate, Herod, and then Herod sent him back to Pilate. And then you'll see there the text, the decisions, approximately the time, the place, and then some of the answers. So we wanted to talk about this today. There just wasn't enough time me, because it's important for us to understand, once again, uh, what Christ went through for our soul's salvation. And then uh, we made a note, uh, and I tried to make this note fairly early, that if you go to Colossians 2, 16 and 17, uh, Paul tells the Colossians there that, uh, therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, nor regards to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of things that are to come, but the reality, however, is found in Christ. And so when we look at the 
the feast of Israel, we don't look at them in terms of trying to keep the law or uphold the law. We look at how each one of them pointed to something that Christ did in the New Testament. Because Christ said, I am not come to uh, abolish the law or get rid of the law. I've come to fulfill it. So he came to fulfill all of the law. And so that is why we take a look at these things. So we start to understand communion. We start to understand the day of Pentecost. Why, were everyone, why was everyone gathered there in Acts chapter number two at the day of Pentecost? So this is kind of the, uh, the, 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 this is kind of the crux, if you will, of, of the lesson, at least where we went when it comes to uh, this, this portion of our lesson today. We started to look at the feast and then start to break them down um, a little bit more. And so the, the feast of Passover, which was when, um, in Exodus chapter number 12, and it had to do with the angel of death, and, and we kind of know that. Uh, you can go to Exodus chapter number 12, uh, but then you'll see a reference made to it in Leviticus chapter number 23, verse 6 through 9. In fact, uh, the majority of these, or a lot of these, are found in Leviticus chapter 23. They, they are also stated, uh, or let's say the occurrence, you'll find in the book of Exodus, because that's when they actually did it. But in terms of being it uh, canonized into the law of Levites, or the, the law at Sinai, you find that in the book of Leviticus. So Leviticus chapter number 23 would be very, uh, very valuable for your reading and study. Uh, but for this one, it was Leviticus chapter number 23. The verse would be 6 through 9. For the, for the sake of time, we won't, uh, we won't read that, but I do want to give that to you as a reference. You'll also find it again in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16, and then 2 Chronicles chapter number 8, the verse is number 13. Now, this one was where they were to go out and, and get a lamb, and they had to inspect the lamb. The lamb was to be without spot or blemish. The lamb was to be sacrificed, and And when you go into Leviticus, it talks about what to do with the meat, the fat, and the blood. And the blood of the lamb had to be smeared over the the, 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 uh, lintels and the doorposts so that the angel of death, when he came by, would pass over that particular house. And so this is a celebration. In fact, when you go into there, you'll see that some of these uh, feasts occur all within one week, and then some of them occur annually. And so that's where we talked about sometimes it gets a little bit confusing. That's why we did a whole study on each one so we can really break down all the differences, which we, didn't just, we just didn't have time uh, to do today. But for us, uh, Christ Jesus is that Passover lamb, and we even know that he was inspected by Pilate in Luke chapter number 23. The verse was number four. And so in this feast, we looked at how Uh, Christ fulfilled the requirement of you going out to slaughter a lamb and what you did with the meat of the lamb and the fat of the lamb and the blood of the lamb by Christ uh, fulfilling that. In in, in fact, that's why in the New Testament he's referred to as the lamb of God. And so Christ's blood now is uh, smeared over the doorposts and lentils of your heart. So God will see that and he will see that perfect sacrifice, that perfect blood on your heart. So you don't need to go out and kill a lamb today. You don't, you don't, you don't, you don't need to burn the, sac- you know, burn, uh, the, uh, the meat. And there, there was even uh, certain requirements where they had uh, to burn uh, the uh, leftovers of the lamb in its entirety. It was a consecration. And we, we don't have time to get into that today. But Christ now has fulfilled that requirement for the Old Testament Passover. And uh, the Bible even lets us know that Christ is now our Passover. If you go on then and take a look at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, whereas the Feast of Passover primarily dealt with the the, uh, blood of the lamb, the uh, Feast of Unleavened Bread has to deal with sin because they were specifically required to remove the, le- the yeast, which, you know, the yeast in the leaven, it causes the dough to rise. And we don't have time to really get too detailed into that. But I love 
there is a study that we did on that because we talked about yeast and what it does and the chemical reaction it has in the dough, and it's an artificial growth, which is why uh, it represents sin because it's not something that should be natural within our lives or our, our bodies. But on this one, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, you can find it uh, in Exodus chapter number 12. The verse would be 14 through 20. And then in there, the, this particular feast, they not only had to use unleavened bread in the making of the dough, but the yeast had to remove, be removed from their territories, and it also had to be removed from their homes. And so we get the concept in the West of spring cleaning, where we go through once a year, however, when you guys do it, you just really scrub your house really good. Well, for them... This was part of a religious practice where they had to remove the yeast. They had to scrub their homes. They scrubbed the wagons. They scrubbed everything that, that might possibly have uh, just a trace of yeast. And you find this instruction to them biblically about their territories in Deuteronomy chapter number 16, verse number 4. And then as far as their quarters or their homes, you will find that in Exodus chapter number 13, the verse there is... Number seven. And so on this one, we didn't, again, have time to talk too much about how, how Christ fulfilled this. But the text that I would have you go to and talk about Christ uh, being uh, the removal of sin would be Romans chapter number six. And it would be verse one through 18. Another thing that we noted is in Matthew 16, verse six through 12, where Jesus is talking about the yeast of the Pharisees or a little leaven would leaven the whole or leaven the whole lump. In 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, verse 6 through 8, the Apostle Paul talks about getting rid of the old yeast or that old sin or that old part of our lives. So whereas the Passover was emblematic of the Messiah being crucified, because the lamb being crucified, the innocent lamb and the blood over the doorpost. The unleavened bread was the uh, emblematic of the Messiah being buried, where you took that part of your life, where you took that sin as he took the sin upon us, and he buried it. He, 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 he put that sin away. And again, you find that, and I would refer to Romans chapter number 6, verse 1 through 18. In the Old Testament, you'll find reference to this as being the bread of affliction. And it was where uh, they had to uh, take this bread and it was part of their remembrance. And this, when we get into Matthew 23, we start to talk about the emblems on the Lord's table. We didn't have time to explore that too much today, but all of this has significance. And I was telling Brother Keith today, people, we don't really wonder why it's crackers. Well, that was symbolic of this unleavened bread, this, this flat bread, if you will. And so that's where we begin to see this. And then you even see uh, Christ when he uh, was about uh, to be uh, offered up. They, they had communion. They had a communion service. And all of that was based on uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The next one was the Feast of First Fruits. Uh, this one you will find articulated in Leviticus chapter number 23 again. There you would go to verse 9 through 14. And on this one, as we mentioned before, it was a time when a sheaf or the first harvest, harvest or barley is presented to the Lord. It was presented as what they call a wave offering. And if you were a poor person, it would be barley. But if you had some means, it would be wheat. And the idea was that since it was an agricultural uh, economy, you would go through and look at your crops and look at your grain and look at everything you had, and you would give God your best. Not so much the first, uh, the first batch you pulled out the ground. No, 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 no. It has nothing to do with a se sequential order. You would go through your field, and you would look for the best wheat, the best barley, and that was giving God 
your first fruit that was showing obedience to God. It was showing your love for God. This gets into Cain and Abel when his one's offering was accepted and the other one was not accepted because he didn't give his first. He didn't give his best. His giving uh, was tainted, so to speak, by his own way of, of, of thinking. So you'll find that once again in Leviticus chapter number 23, verse 9 through 14. And Christ being the first fruits, he's being our first fruits. And there are so many places in Scripture uh, that you find uh, Christ being the first fruit. Uh, and you even see it in the Old Testament. Nehemiah chapter number 10, verse 35 talks about. Uh, the first fruit, uh, you'll find Ezekiel chapter number 44, verse number 30. Uh, and then you'll see in Proverbs 3, 9, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. And then when you get on, uh, you'll start to see it mentioned even more, particularly in the Hebrew letter. But just as we begin to look at these feasts and we see how Christ fulfilled them, you know, it was the Apostle Paul that talked about going, going back one to the, uh, to the Passover in 1 Corinthians chapter number 5, the verses number 7, where Paul specifically makes reference to Christ as being the Passover. He says, your glory is not good. You know, um, you know not a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven that you a new lump, as ye are unleavened. Excuse me. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. That's 1 Corinthians chapter number 5. The verse number is 7. And then when you start talking about the first fruit, Paul in that 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which deals with the resurrection, he refers to Christ as our first fruits. You'll find 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, the verse is number 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And as you go into John chapter number 12, verse number 17, there's a little sidebar where Mary was there and he said to her, touch me not for I am not yet ascended to my father. In other words, we, we kind of look past that and we don't understand it. And then he says, but go unto my brother and say unto them, I am ascended unto my father and your father and to my God and to your God. We don't understand. Okay, Jesus, why didn't you allow or want Mary to touch you? Because as the first fruit, as the unspotted, he didn't want her to physically touch him yet. He was going to go present himself to the Father, spotless, clean, uh, being, once again, being resurrected. And so that's just, again, some, some things where we begin to understand uh, the concept of first fruits, the concept of the best, the concept of giving God what, what he's due and what he's worth. And that's why we went over to Exodus chapter number 33 verses number 10, because we noted there when uh, they were out in the wilderness and when the pillar of cloud came by and, it, it, and, and it, it descended, every man had to get up in his tent and stood at his tabernacle door because it was appointed time. God was there. You find that Exodus 33, 10, and all the people saw the cloudy pillar stand at the tabernacle door and all the people rose up and what? Worshiped. They, ro they rose up and worship, and we do our lesson series on worship. That is one of the texts we go to, Exodus 33, 10, because the fact that they stood at attention, every man in his door, meant that they were giving God that attention. They weren't playing Game Boy. They weren't, they weren't uh, uh, looking through Netflix. They weren't, wait a minute, God is here. Let me stand up and stand at attention. This is why the Apostle Paul, we went on Romans chapter number 12, and we notice verse 1 and 2, and the word acceptable is found two times in those verses. A lot of people go to Romans 12, 1 through 3 to talk about our worship being a living sacrifice, that we worship 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not just when we come to the building. Okay, that's a different discussion for a different time. But the point that we're making here is two times in those passages, the Apostle Paul says, holy and acceptable. It's not whatever you want to give God. It's not, it's, the first fruit doesn't mean just go grab an old piece of barley out there on the edge of the grass and give it to God. You go back to the book of Malachi, that's what the whole uh, issue that God had, and he told Malachi to go tell the people, give that to your governor. See if he will be happy with that. They gave him lame animals and blind animals, and, and they were 
they were following the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law. So it's very important when we talk about worshiping God, we have to worship in a manner that is acceptable to him, not uh, what's called, and Paul calls it in uh, uh, the Colossian letter, Ethelorescia, which is will worship, our own self-worship, the way we want to worship. So we don't, uh, uh, we don't want to do that. Then the next one was probably the one that we know the most, the P uh, Feast of Pentecost or Shavuot or Weeks. Uh, and if you went back to the road to Emmaus on Luke chapter number 24, when Jesus uh, met with them and they didn't believe that Jesus was really there. And then when they got uh, to Emmaus, that's where we have the whole scene with doubting Thomas. And Jesus, he wanted to see Jesus' hand and Jesus showed him and, he, and he, he just was amazed that Christ was resurrected. And Jesus, uh, he left them there, but he said, go to Jerusalem and tarry in Jerusalem. Pente being 50. So this, this feast was 50 days after these first three. And this one was more of a gathering of the harvest. It was a gathering of the harvest in the Old Testament culture. But the reason why it's important for us, because when you go to Acts chapter number two, and you see there on the day of Pentecost, and you see all the names of the people from all the various nations, Medes, Persians, uh, uh, all these people, Jews from, from Rome, Cappadocia, you start reading. It was a harvest of nations, a harvest of people that were coming back to God on the day of Pentecost. So once again, now that this harvest uh, that they had in the Old Testament of, of physical harvest of wheat and grain, uh, that has been fulfilled because now that Christ has brought in the church or the introduction of the church, the body of Christ, now that harvest is of souls. The harvest is of people. So Christ has also uh, fulfilled, fulfilled uh, this one, the harvest of Pentecost. If you wanted to look at that biblically from the Old Testament perspective, you would go back to Leviticus 23 and you would look at verse 15 and 16. Leviticus 23, verse 15 and 16. The, those are the spring feasts. And then the fall feasts, which is the Feast of Trumpet, the last trump, the Day of Atonement, the Great Trump, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the new habitation. Those, although they are mentioned in the Old Testament, the Feast of Israel, is, it's, it's kind of like a playbook for a football coach. When you look at the feast or the appointed times, and you look at the reasons for the appointed times, and you look at how all of these pointed towards Christ, and as we mentioned in John chapter number 19, the verse was number 30, he said, it is finished. This is when he was on the cross. And that word we noted was to tell us that. It is finished. It is done. It is paid in full. And so when Christ said it is finished and then he gave up his spirit, gave up his ghost, gave up the ghost, that means all the things that were prophesied in the law and in, in the Old Testament, all the things that were said of the Messiah and the, and the work that he came to do was done. So we don't celebrate or even if people celebrate these, these final three today, that's fine. Do whatever you want to do, but that don't make you saved in the eyesight of God because those were future and I'll get to a slide that articulates that uh, in a minute. <clears throat> but those were kind of the, the Feast of Israel. And we, we, we got to this text again by going back to the book of Acts, chapter number 18, the verses number 21. Because the Apostle Paul says, I must needs keep the, this feast in Jerusalem. In other words, he had an appointment. He had something on his, that, on his heart that he had to do that was related to God. Now, we, didn't, we, we did, actually. We did talk about Colossians. And I uh, will get into that a little bit later when, when you go over to the Corinthian letter. And he talks about, uh, you know, uh, to the Jew, I, I became a Jew. To the Greek, I became a Greek. I mean, Paul was going to Jerusalem not to have a meal, Brother Tony. He wasn't traveling all the way there to go down there and eat some bitter herbs and stuff like that. Yeah, that might have been part of it culturally. But the Apostle Paul was going there to preach the gospel. He had good news. 
He had learned about Christ Jesus. He had learned about the anointed one. He was excited. He was on fire. He says, I want to stay with y'all here, but I must needs get to Jerusalem. It's going to be a gang of people there. And I want to go and I want to let them know about our risen Lord, our risen Savior. So Paul was not doing anything to be in compliance with the law, but to the furtherance of the gospel. These are the, uh, the future ones that I, that I referenced before. Let's take a look at these real quick. Because if you look at the fall feast, uh, we see the Feast of Trumpets or the Last Trump. You find that uh, biblically, noting that it's in the future in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, once again, that is that great chapter in Paul's letter to the church at Corinth that, that the whole chapter deals with the resurrection. But in verse 52, he says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the what? Last the last trump. For the trump has sound, shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. In other words, this is in the future. This is one that's going to, a trump that's going to announce the, uh, the, the, that Christ Jesus is looking for us and that he is ready uh, to, uh, to fulfill this one. And again, you'll find this one mentioned once again in Leviticus chapter number 23, the Feast of, Feast of Trumpets. Then the Feast of Atonement, also in Leviticus 23. This one marks his return. And you'll find this one, the great trump. Matthew 24, verse 31 says, And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a what? Trumpet. And they have gathered. No, they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So just as we talked about uh, the uh, Mount Sinai, if you guys go back uh, to the book of Numbers and, and you look at uh, uh, how the people were so afraid when God descended down to Mount Sinai, remember there was a trumpet blast and we talked about the fire, we talked about the earthquake, we talked about the ground shaking. If, if you and I were back in those days and it was very, very dark because they didn't have the city lights, but you're at the mountain of God and you hear this trumpet blast and then the earthquake and the fire coming, it was a very scary sight. But the trumpet blast was to announce that God was at the mountain or that he was ready to at least engage in, with Moses. And so we find the same, the same trumpet blast here when, when Christ Jesus returns. And then the last one, the Feast of Tabernacles. You'll find this again in Leviticus chapter number 23 and a few other places. They also refer to, to it sometimes as the Feast of Booths. You'll find it listed there as Feast of Booths. Uh, but this one we find in Revelation chapter number 21, verse 1 through 4. And I saw, this is John the Revelator speaking, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, saying what, brother? And behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, uh, for the former things are passed away. So once again, that is dealing with a future a uh, uh, future. Uh, uh, fulfilling of that uh, particular uh, feast. So then we started to make some application. And we said, okay, now, Brother Williams, that's good. And that's good for us to know. But how does Paul travel to Jerusalem or me studying this lesson, how does that affect my life? So we went over to the old man, or the old man in Ecclesiastes, and we talked to him. And we see right at the beginning of Ecclesiastes chapter number three, the verse number one, it says, to everything there is a season. And that word in the Hebrew, because we know most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, that word in Hebrew was zimal, and it was an appointed time, at a time to every purpose under the heaven. And this 
word that's translated as season is only used four times in the Bible. And every time you find it, it means an appointed time. And so uh, Ecclesiastes starts off right at the beginning, verse chapter number three. He says, to everything there is a season. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to uh, to refrain From embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh? In that where he labored. What do you get out of your life? What do you get out of the things that you're doing right now? What do you get, uh, even though you may profit the whole world, what does it mean if you lose your soul? Verse 10, I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. And also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. And also, okay, that's 13, 14. And I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken away from it. And and God doeth it, that men should fear before him. I I have a a saying that sometimes men, we think that we can, men, mankind, I should say, we think that we can sometimes play God. We start to mess with atoms and DNA and we try to, uh, clone babies and animals and you know some of that obviously is good for medical research and you know that's how they are able to mass produce certain drugs and vaccines but then we always take that a little bit too far and we always try to make a dog's back leg straight and I always just just I laugh about that because it's funny but you know men will try to do that men will try to do that they will always try to play God and try to make something change that God made that dog dog's back leg bent like that and they'll try to fix the dog to where his leg is straight. That's just how man is. That which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been, and God require that which is past. Two more verses. And moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment. That wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. And I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a what? Time there for every purpose and for every work. So we were looking today at the Apostle Paul as he traveled back. He had... Uh, and an appointed time, he had something to do. He had to be in Jerusalem, and his business there was related to God and what God would have him to do. And we also know that Hebrews chapter number nine, this is where we took the application, and then sometimes we do something that's, that's where you, you propose to the audience a question, and you leave the question on the hearts and minds of the people. And in this one, we looked at Hebrews chapter number 9. The verse was number 27. 
where it says, is, it is appointed unto men once to die. Every one of us got a date, Brother Tony. We got a destiny. We have an appointed time. We have a moed or a moedim, if you want to call it. We have an appointed time. It is appointed unto men once to die. But after this is the judgment. So not only are we going to die in our physical bodies, but then there's going to be something else that happens after that. There's going to be a judgment. Where God is going to look upon each and every one of us and look at all the things that we did in our lives, all of our secret sins, all of the issues of the heart that we, we, we spend so much time uh, trying to bargain with God, trying to reason with ourselves, trying to convince ourselves, oh, I've got time, not knowing that COVID is right around the corner. But there is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was once offered, verse 28 of Hebrews 9, to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And so while we have time, while we are on this side, time side of life, while we are, are, are still able, it behooves all of us to make sure that we are getting our lives right with the Lord. And as we mentioned before, and I said this, you know, I, I didn't mean to get too personal in the lesson this morning, but. You know, I tried, Brother Dash, to do it my own way. I tried to come to God. I tried to come to the Lord on my own terms. I told God, you know, I'm not ready. I told God, I can't come to you right now. I'm dirty. I got sin in my life, whether it's gambling, whether it's whatever. You know, whoever you are, whatever your sin is, I got mine, you got yours, whatever it is. I was saying to myself, I can't go to God can't go to church, man. I was at the club last night. Brother Keith, I can't do this. I was out smoking last week or whatever it is that people go through in their lives. They reason with themselves that I can't go to God right now. I can't go to God because I know I'm dirty. And my problem was I used that to keep me away. I used that as an excuse or a crutch to say, I don't want to go because the people are going to look at me funny. I don't want to go because I still got this going on. I still got that going on. I just made excuse after excuse after excuse. And I tell this story many times. God bless my mom. She's gone right now. And I had this conversation with her sitting in her living room. And this little 85-year-old lady pointed her bony finger right at my face. And she said, Daryl, you trying to be perfect before you go to God. And Sister Alicia, I couldn't say nothing. <laughs> She was right. I, I just looked. And I, I, I just thought, brother, don't, I mean, uh, uh, brother, I just thought for a second. I said, man, she's right. I'm trying to make myself perfect to go to God so he can make me perfect. And she said, you can't do it. And that was, I believe, the beginning of the turning point in my life where I began to realize that I needed to go to God exactly the way I was with my dirt, with my sins, with my hang-ups, with my habits, with my limitations, with my struggles. I needed to go to God the way God would have me and receive me and not try to do everything myself first. And that comes down to obedience. That just comes down to letting go. That just comes down to looking at God and say, God, I'm, I'm a sinner. Help me. And that was the beginning of a long road that I'm still on right now. And and I just hope that that uh, is a road that someone else would uh, cross or get on before it's everlasting too late. Because nobody knows the time. Nobody knows the hour. You might go to the gas station and get COVID and be in the hospital. Nobody sees you. And then it's too late now. It's, it, it's, it's done. Because God gave you grace. He gave you mercy. He gave you time. He gave you opportunity upon opportunity upon opportunity. And you just kind of were almost rebellious in a sense that you said, well, you know what, God, not right now. I'm just not going to do it. I understand. I know I need to do it. I understand. I, I, I need to give my life over to you. I understand that you commanded everyone to be baptized. I understand what you told us to do, but God, I'm not ready. You're going to have to wait. 
in other words. And the next thing you know, when your appointed time comes, then it's like Jesus said, weeping and mashing of teeth where the worm never died. And so that's just something that we started to look at, um, or I, I should say, I, I started to reflect on my own life. So while we have just a couple minutes left, just any thoughts or comments at all uh, about uh, this lesson? I, once again, I just thought it was, uh, while it was a small sliver of text, I just thought it was too important for us to run by it, and we wanted to spend a little time, a little time on that. Any, any thoughts or comments at all? So just kind of here at the end when you talk about um, kind of like trying to be perfect and come to God already perfect and all that, it, it stuck with me because the other day I listened to uh, Brother Billy Washington down in, um, I believe yeah. it's Florida. Yeah, Florida. Yeah. And he talked about we won't go to heaven based on anything that we've done. It will be by the grace of God. Amen. And that we will leave this earth with work undone, yes. but we just strive to try to complete as much work as you can. Amen. So it kind of tied in with that when you mm -hmm. said that, mm -hmm. and that, that just kind of just stuck with me. That's all yeah. I wanted to say. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah, we, you know, we're not perfect in this building. You know, we are all on a journey just like everyone else, just like the Apostle Paul was. And so we are the last ones to... Uh, get up and like Paul said, where then is boasting? I believe he said that in Romans chapter number three, right around verse number 29 or 30. He says, where then is boasting? Because he was talking about the propitiation and the blood of Christ and how we are saved by grace through faith, that obedience that we then reciprocate based on our understanding of what Christ has done to us. And so Paul says, well, where is boasting then? So we're not here as, you know, uh, you know, super Christian or goody two shoes or none of that. No, we are still on that same struggle with everyone else. The only thing we try to do is continuing to remember the cross, remember what Christ Jesus did for us, how he died for our sins, how he by his stripes we are healed, and then how we go out and continue to try to spread and share the good news. The good news of the gospel it says, hey, man, you dirty right now. You got sin all over you. you. You dirty. But hey, look, through Christ, you can have that sin cleansed. You can have that propitiation through his blood. And then we want to also make sure that we are looking at the text carefully and doing the very best that we can as, as the Bereans were. They were trying to understand what Paul was saying. And I believe it's Peter that uh, said that sometimes the things that Paul writes are hard to understand. And I think it, uh, it behooves us all to slow down a little bit and not run past verses that, you know, again, might not be the sexiest, might not be, you know, might not be the glamour text, you know, it might not be John 3.16, you know, everybody loves that. But uh, sometimes we want to understand because first fruits and all those things are mentioned throughout the Bible. And we want to understand what it means when we run into those. Uh, we are just about straight up, uh, straight up on the hour. Any other thoughts or comments? I'm going to ask Brother Keith if he can prepare his heart and close us with a word of prayer. We definitely want to remember uh, our Brother Kumar. Brother Kumar, God bless you, brother. We love you. Uh, we're praying for you, brother. We know that you're half a world away, but you are our brother in Christ, and we are praying for you and your family and the work there in the congregation uh, that you continue to fight that good fight of faith. We also want to pray for Brother Gerald uh, and Julie. Uh, we, we know that they have uh, contracted COVID and they are home. Uh, we just pray that the, uh, that the virus runs its course and that they both have full and complete recovery. I think we know about Sister Monique and Sister Khadija DeBray, Sister Paula, uh, uh, Mike and Joe Foster, uh, all the saints uh, that uh, have asked for prayer requests in the past and that might still be looking for prayer requests. So is there anyone else that has any prayer requests right now? Okay. Brother Keith, could you close? Dear Heavenly Father, we'd just like to thank you for this very blessed class that you got it brought us to Mammy father we'd like to thank you for this day that you have seen us through but Mammy father i just like for you to 
just hear us right now because we're lifting up our brothers and our sisters, lifting up Gerald and his wife. We're lifting up Sister Bray and Khadijah and Paula and Sister Willie and Brother Willie, the Willie family, Tony and his family, Brother Dash and his family, Brother Heavenly Father. We just like to ask that you just bless all those that we love those that we don't know and those that we do know. Put your hedge around them, my Heavenly Father. Father, this COVID is grabbing at all my brothers and sisters, and I ask that you just strengthen them, keep them. Lord, you're the great physician. You can do all things, my Heavenly Father, and we ask in Jesus' name that you do these things. My Heavenly Father, we ask that you just watch over us as we go through this new week that's approaching. My Heavenly Father, we ask that you just take care of us on our own individual paths as we go through this world, my Heavenly Father, and those that are looking at us see the Christ in us. Amen. My Heavenly Father, I ask that as we leave here tonight, that you be with us through the night. My Heavenly Father, and we'd like to thank you for your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for without him we would not be able to come approach the bent bench of heaven right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you. We send out glory, glory hallelujahs to your name. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen.